Second talk. Okay. The title is Hardware Masking Revisited. And the speaker is Thomas de Knude from KU Leuven Kosik. And he will uh, name his co authors, I guess. Thank you. Um, so, my co authors, uh, Mike and Amir, uh, they're, they're part of this work, of course. I want to thank them for uh, this work. Uh, so, in this talk, we're going to look at uh, some foundational assumptions uh, of hardware masking. And for that, we turn our attention to one of the seminal papers on this topic. Uh, there's a paper uh, by Shari and co authors. And in that paper, they uh, take a, a scientific approach to counter the problem with DPA. So they create a model so they can reason inside the model about security of masking. Uh, in a first assumption, they make the reasonable assumption that uh, coupling and other uh, type of these effects can be ignored. And so they start from a linear model where the total power consumption of the circuit uh, should be decomposable as uh, the individual power consumptions of the uh, shares of the masking scheme. Now, they are aware, of course, that that is not always satisfied. There are effects like uh, temperature, voltage, uh, coupling that can violate that assumption. And that is exactly what we investigate in this paper. Uh, but why, why would we stop there at these, this small list? We, we can have a look at our measurement setup, which is based around uh, the Sakura G FPGA. And we can list other parameters that we can control as well. Both uh, can control as an attacker as well as a uh, designer. So we have the supply voltage that we can influence. We have the shunt resistor that we can, uh, over which we measure that we can influence. We can influence the distance of, a sh of the shares as uh, designers. We can increase and decrease the temperature. We can increase the circuit size as designers. And uh, we can alter the clock frequency. And finally, we can also alter the masking scheme itself, use higher uh, order masking scheme or a lower order masking scheme. And in this talk, we're going to investigate the effect of these uh, parameters. Uh, and for that, we first uh, are going to design a small uh, experimental setup with a toy example, uh, just to investigate this whole list of parameters um, that could possibly influence the leakage. Afterwards, we, we're going to look at our, the main question which we want to answer in this research is, can we actually use these parameters to make mask implementations leak? And finally, we will end with a summary and some implications of our work. But first, uh, our toy example. We decided to create um, uh, a set of mixed column uh, instances and chain them uh, after one another. And this will form one share of our masking scheme. Um, we can activate and deactivate the last uh, three mixed columns here. So we can play around with lower power consumption or higher consumption uh, within our masking scheme. Uh, secondly, we route four of such instances, which we call iterated mixed columns. We route them completely separated, that is both uh, in placement and routing, on the floor plan of our FPGA. Hopefully this translates to reality, but we have no reason to believe why it wouldn't. Uh, and this way, we can not only uh, play around with the order of the masking scheme of, of this linear iterated mi mixed columns by, for example, having only a first order implementation by only considering the first two shares, having a second order implementation considering the first three shares, or a third order implementation considering all the shares. We can also play around with the distance. We can look at a first order implementation only considering the first and the second mixed columns, uh, closer, uh, where the shares are placed closer in this masking scheme, or we can look at a first order implementation between mixed columns one and mixed columns four, having our shares placed further away. With that, we look at uh, the parameters. So let's take a fixed shunt resistor and we increase the power supply voltage. And I think the clearest would be the purple line versus the black diamond line where we only increase the power supply. The rule we have there is the higher the supply voltage, the higher the leakage. Taking the supply voltage fixed uh, and lowering the shunt resistor over which we measure, that would be the black line to the purple line, 
we see that the lower the shunt resistor over which we measure, the higher the leakage. As for a distance, uh, we compared these three first order mask implementations, that is uh, between the first column and the second one, between the first and the third, and the first and the fourth. And we surprisingly see that distance does not matter much in the observed leakage. As for the temperature, we varied from room temperature of 21 degrees, uh, over 50 degrees, uh, up to 70 degrees for the temperature chamber. And we nicely see that the higher the temperature, the higher the leakage. For the circuit size and the clock frequency, let's have a look at a constant uh, clock frequency. So we go from uh, three mixed columns to six mixed columns. We see that the higher, uh, the larger the circuits or the more mixed columns are active, the higher the leakage. And now with a fixed number of mixed columns, that would be, for example, the blue triangles and the brown stars, we see that the higher the clock frequency, the higher the leakage. The rule we can extract from that, because both the circuit size and uh, the clock frequency, they're related to the peak-to-peak -peak power consumption. We group them under the umbrella. The higher the peak-to-peak -peak power consumption, the higher the leakage. As for the number of shares, not surprisingly, the lower number of shares, the higher the leakage. What is surprising, though, is that we see first-order leakage in all these implementations. Uh, the implementation with only two shares, where we expect first-order security leaks the fastest in the first order security, uh, but later we also see uh, leakage in the second and third order implementations. We have to note though, that there was no second order in, uh, leakage in the second order secure implementation, and there was no third order leakage in the third order secure implementation. That's it for those parameters we listed at the start, but we are working on an FPGA, and on FPGAs, wires consume quite a lot of power compared to uh, on ASIC. So, we end this small experiment on the toy example with, uh, some, with an experiment that will look at uh, coupling between wiring of the FPGA. For that, we look at the structure of an FPGA. That's basically a regular pattern of uh, some lookup tables that can be wired together through switch matrices. And while we don't have any um, specific concrete idea about how these look inside, how these switch matrices are composed of, we, it's reasonable to assume that uh, they consist of a bunch of transistors, which can be configured to be either open switches or closed switches, depending on the bitstream that is stored in the ASRAM. Now, let's say we have a first-order implementation. Two shares are routed on the different red wires there, X1 and X2. It's possible that open transistors have a leakage current and couple these. Um, and for that, we need to design an experiment to check whether this is potentially uh, a threat. So we design a metric, and the metric we use is the number of shared open switches. Uh, that means for two given input wires, we list all the possible output connections uh, to which they can be routed. And uh, the higher that is, the more of these units we have. So that would be one unit. Uh, and we, increase, we take a couple of switch matrices uh, in a row, and we increasingly route uh, wires through them and increase that, that metric. So we have three different uh, experiments, one where we have zero of those shared connections, one where we have 20 of those shared connections uh, in the middle here, and the last one where we have the highest number of shared connections is 20 and 16. So we actually need uh, a lot of these redundant ones where we cannot really do anything just to get uh, the wires on the right track um, we take those uh, adjacent switch matrices, we put them right in between uh, two of our uh, mixed columns, and then we perform our tests and we see that it, the routing does not really influence uh, the effect much. So the observed leakage does not depend that much on the routing. And I think with that, we have enough uh, parameters to play around, uh, to play around effectively to try to make masked implementations leak. And for that, we take uh, established masking schemes from the literature. Uh, we have a threshold implementation of present from uh, Poshman and co-authors. We also have a domain-oriented masking of AES, first and second order by uh, Gross and uh, co-authors. And we have a D plus one threshold implementations of AES by myself and co-authors. And what we get is um, a three shared first order present implementation that 
in the regular conditions with a power supply voltage of one volt and uh, one ohm shunt resistor does not leak. But as soon as we increase that power supply voltage, we get a nice leakage. For this uh, AES implementations, we have uh, that all designs leak, so both uh, the first and second order implementations of domain-oriented masking, as well as the first and second order domain uh, implementations of the D plus one TI, and uh, they leak a lot faster uh, and stronger than uh, our present implementation. To conclude, uh, can we make mass implementation leak? That's a clear yes. How can we do that? We can alter the leakage uh, confidence by, uh, we can increase it by hiring the supply voltage, by lowering the shunt resistor over which we measure, by increasing the temperature in which we measure, by increasing the peak-to-peak -peak power consumption. That's either increasing the, uh, the clock frequency or, if, as a designer, using larger circuits. By lowering the number of shares, which is not surprisingly, if you only have one share, basically you have an unmasked implementation, you leak anyway. We also saw that leakage does not depend, depend much on the distance you have between the shares, nor does it depend on the number of open transistors or the leakage currents in those open transistors between the shares. For some implications, the assumptions can be validate, violated, that is not surprising, and uh, in masking literature, in hardware masking, that has been shown by, uh, amongst others, Mangag and co-authors, uh, with glitches and early signal propagation. More surprisingly is that a correctly masked implementation, where we take real care in making sure we translate the theory to the practice correctly, can leak. But it's in a lab environment, so what is the real-world implication? And that is where we can pose the question, the main question of our future work is, can this be exploited by an attacker? And if so, how? Uh, also more related to practice, if we look at ASICs, what do we expect? Can we translate the results from FPGA right away to ASIC? Perhaps not. But one thing is sure, we likely need more traces due to higher noise in the ASICs. Before, we conclude, uh, before uh, I open for questions, um, some solutions. Temporal non-completeness would be a solution. Uh, sadly, it's very expensive. It would mean that we don't process on more than D shares at any given uh, point in time, so at any clock cycle, uh, to achieve D order security. So for a first order implementation, that means we process the shares sequentially, just as in software, basically invalidating all the, uh, the strong uh, advantages of, of hardware. We could embed voltage regulators so an attacker could not raise the voltage uh, of the power supply, but then again, you can always increase the temperature and make the design leak or tweak some other parameters. Uh, just as in the talk of the FPGA hammer yesterday, we uh, could isolate some supply voltages, so uh, basically share the supply voltage lines, but it's not clear how to design nonlinear uh, mass implementations in that way. Finally, we could deploy the leakage uh, test in addition to attacks. So we could use the t-test uh, in scenarios where it is strong to identify leakages of implementations fast. Uh, but to validate, finally, I think it's a nice if a masking scheme is validated in a realistic environment. Uh, and for that, some uh, authors have been using the moments uh, correlating DPA, and we'll see a talk about that tomorrow. And with that, uh, I'm ready for your questions. Thank you. Thomas, uh, questions? Thomas? Okay, thanks for the. Sorry. Was wondering. <laughs> I was wondering if you add more uh, external amplifiers, will it like, uh, help you find the leakage more quickly? Um, I have to direct that question to. Uh, no, we do not add uh, any more amplifiers. So I guess we use a standard setup for, for our measurements. So I'm saying if you add more um, amplifiers, will it help you to find the leakage more quickly? 
uh, externally. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, having an internal amplification, I felt um, I was I was referring. Do you hear me? Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, I was referring to the case that you have um, one circuit which is larger, which consumes more energy, and it has more effect on the amount of power consumption or energy consumption of the other part of the circuit, which operates on the other share. Thank you, Amir. More questions? Benedict. Okay. Test, test, test. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Um, thanks for the talk. So, what I missed maybe when you showed the, the plots in which orders you found leakage and so on, I, I missed um, in which orders did you expect to find leakage and okay. why did you not expect? Like you said, I think you said you found always first order leakage, yes. but no second or third order leakage. Um, yes. Even though you use four shares, so. Well, it's always a surprise if you don't make a hypothesis, right? <laughs> yeah, so but uh, we, I, I, we, I think I missed the point there. To, to um, we expect, of course, we expect no leakage. If we if we have a first order implementation, we don't expect first order leakage. If we have a second order implementation. We don't expect first and second order leakage. Okay, but so but even if you use four shares, you find only first order leakage? Yes, and we did not find second or third. Okay, but that may just be that the measurement setup was not good enough to see that. There will, be, there will always be noise, yeah. I, there, there might be, of course. Uh, it, I think it could be, but you, like you say, it's just too noisy that we cannot see it. Okay, okay. I would be surprised if it only is in the first order, but not in the second order. So the fact that there's noise in the second order masks that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. We have time for one more question. Yeah, all the way back. Can you hear me? No? Yeah, I hear you. Not anymore? Uh, what of which one of your uh, concrete observations hold for A6? Okay, so the question, if I get it right, is which of our parameters uh, would influence Obs conclusions? Which of the conclusions. of the conclusions? Observations and conclusions. Maybe go back to the slide yeah, with observation yeah, okay. and conclusions. Which of these of the solutions? Uh, it's very hard to talk through this. Yeah. Uh, observations and conclusions okay. hold for ASICs because yeah. they have totally different uh, structures, uh, powers especially with respect to the ratio of leakage and mm. uh, active po dynamic power. So, I mean, some of these observations I would imagine that not necessarily hold for ASICs. Yes, I, I agree. I think the only way I can answer that question correctly is by performing these uh, experiments on an ASIC. Um, although I don't think that it will be that different. So for sure we need more traces, but the temperature, increasing the temperature on ASIC, I would be surprised if that would not lead to higher leakage. Whether we can observe that or not is, is then for the measurement setup. But. Um, it's, it's fair to assume that similar problems will be there, but that um, more, leak, more traces are required to see it. Okay, let's thank the speaker. Thanks.